In this episode, we'll take a look at the Panasonic DMW XLR1 audio adapter. First of all, what is the XLR1? It is an audio adapter that allows you to attach two XLR microphones directly to your Panasonic GH5. The most important question, of course, is how does it sound? Well, throughout this entire review, you will hear the audio that's recorded with the Panasonic GH5, the XLR1, and will indicate the microphone that we're using throughout each of the clips, just so you can have a sense for what those sound like. First of all, let's give you a little tour here. It's a nice small size. It weighs in at about 0.5 pounds, 227 grams. So this is really kind of one of its biggest strong points. Very small, very light, and it makes it keeps your rig very small, which is a super big plus. It is made out of mostly plastic, so it's a decent quality plastic with a metal hot shoe connector and a lock that keeps it in the hot shoe. The nice thing about the hot shoe connector is that there are no cables to connect it to the camera, so it connects and communicates directly through the hot shoe. One little thoughtful feature is this plastic window that you can move up when you're setting the controls, but then you move it back down to keep people from bumping it during recording. Most everything is set on the XLR1 with these switches and a couple of dials or potentiometers here on the control surface. And there are a couple settings in the camera's menu as well. In terms of switches, the first one is one that lets you control the type of input you have, whether that's mic without phantom power, mic with phantom power, or a line level input. Another one for gain level, with settings for plus 20 dB, 0 dB, and minus 20 dB. There's another switch for a low cut filter or a high pass filter, same thing, different names. There are settings for off, 16 hertz and 160 hertz. The 160 hertz setting is probably most useful in cases where there is the risk of a little bit of wind and you wanna uh, reduce some of that rumbling noise you get with wind. There's another switch here that you can use if you're recording with just one mic. You can set it to send the single mic to both the left and right channels on the camera audio, which is really helpful so you don't have to mess with that in post. Or if you're recording two mics, it records one to the left channel and the other to the right channel. So in post, you can actually do some mixing. There's a switch to enable or disable automatic level control. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a minute. And then of course, there is an audio level dial for each of the two inputs. There's an LED on the back to indicate that the unit is being powered by the camera. And indeed, that is the only way to power this device. There is no other power input options, but it's also a major convenience factor as well. You don't have to have another power source. It all comes from the camera. There's a little clip underneath here to manage XLR cables, because you do have them kind of dangling down from the top of the camera. And then there are rubber covers for the two metal and plastic XLR inputs. And just a note, there are no quarter inch inputs. Within the camera, there are some additional settings for the unit in terms of how it records the audio. You can choose 16 or 24 bit, and you can also choose a sample rate at 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz. With consumer level audio gear, there are generally two kind of weak points. One is self noise generated in the preamplifier. Another is limited dynamic range. Now, I don't have a specific test here for dynamic range aside from using the automatic level control. Let's look at that first. Now, one of the challenges is if you have the gain level set and suddenly your talent gets much louder than they were in the sound check, you can get some digital clipping and distortion. It doesn't sound great, and it generally will ruin recording if it gets too bad. You can fix it if it's not too bad. You can take a look at our previous episode here on how you can fix that in Adobe Audition, but you generally want to avoid it. And we did a test here where we set the gain level pretty high. I talked into it and we were getting some distortion even with the automatic level control on, which is interesting. The way Panasonic defines the automatic level control is at high volumes, the recording level is decreased to reduce distortion with the sound. Sounds very much like a limiter to me. The problem is here, it seems like it's actually implemented in the digital stage. If you don't understand what that means, the practical impact is that it's not perfect. It's not going to catch situations where your talent suddenly gets very loud. You will still get some distortion. So here we go. Test one, two, three, four, five. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Unfortunately, the XLR1 also does not appear to have a safety track recording feature. So where you record the same microphone at two different gain levels in case the talent do get loud, in post you can drop to the lower gain recording and actually prevent that distortion. Now we did a variety of sort of practical noise tests here. These are not super scientific, but um, this is what I found here. So I set the gain level to zero dB and the audio level to 50%, which is where I needed to set it to get my peaks hitting minus 12 dB with my Audio-Technica AT4053B hypercardioid microphone. And what we found was the noise floor sat at minus 70 dB, which is actually really, really quite good. I was surprised by that. 
The next test we did was with a dynamic microphone, specifically the Electrovoice RE50L, which is a reporter's microphone. Now, the interesting thing with these types of microphones is they require a lot of gain. So we definitely had to up the gain setting. So I set it to zero dB and I set the audio level to max to get the peaks somewhere around minus 12 dB, which is normally where you wanna be. In post, I normalized the audio to minus 23 LUFS, which is the European TV broadcast standard for loudness. And what we found was that the noise level sat at minus 56 dB. So definitely things got a lot noisier here. So normally I like to see those levels at minus 60 dB or lower. So this was kind of on the edge there and it may get a little bit noisy if you're going to be working with these specific types of microphones. But these aren't necessarily the type of things that all filmmakers use. They're kind of uh, depending on the type of shooting you're doing. So may not be the best choice if you're going to be doing a lot of work with dynamic microphones. We're now recording with the Electrovoice RE50L into the Panasonic DMW XLR1. Make sure I got that right. Yes, DMW XLR1. And that, of course, is connected to the Panasonic GH5. Now, in case you are worried about that, there are other possibilities. So, for example, you could also run the microphone through a high-quality mixer and then feed that into the Panasonic XLR1. So in another test, what I did was I connected the Electrovoice RE50L, again, the reporter's microphone, into a sound device of 633, and then fed a line level signal from the 633 into the XLR1. And in that case, we found that the noise floor sat at minus 64 dB. So using all the same methods, normalizing to minus 23 LUFS. Here is a great example of how we could get that noise floor down, and it worked great. All right, we are now recording with, again, with the uh, Electrovoice RE50L, which is a dynamic microphone, omnidirectional reporter's microphone. This is routed into the uh, Sound Devices 633. Now, all other noise tests are gonna depend on the microphone. If you're using a condenser microphone of some sort, whether that be a shotgun microphone or a hypercardioid or supercardioid non-shotgun boom microphone, you can generally expect that if the microphone is not a terribly noisy one, it's going to work great with the XLR1. Now, because the XLR1 is powered by the camera, I wanted to do a test here to see how long I could get on a single battery with a GH5 recording 4K, 422, 10-bit, and uh, with, a with a single phantom-powered microphone, which is kind of a scenario that I'll be using a lot. And what I found was I got two hours and 13 minutes recording solid the entire time. And actually that was a little bit better than I, or I guess maybe right in line or maybe a little bit better than I was expecting. So because the single battery is powering both the camera and the XLR1 and Phantom powering a mic, I think that's pretty decent. Overall, the pros on the XLR1, I think first and foremost, the preamplifiers actually sound quite good. I was really impressed with the way they sound. Do they have a lot of dynamic range? Well, they're not really in the same league as something like a Sound Devices mixer that costs $3,300, but they are pretty good and uh, I think definitely usable. They also have pretty good noise performance if you're using a condenser mic of any sort. Again, that's gonna be a shotgun mic or a non-shotgun boom mic of some other sort like a hypercardioid or a supercardioid. As long as the microphone isn't terribly noisy on its own, you're gonna get an overall good result. One of the big advantages is this is very, very small and compact and it's simple to use. You connect it to the hot shoe and you're in business. The hot shoe connector itself seems fairly robust. The build quality of the XLR1 is pretty plasticky, but it seems like a decent quality plastic that should hold up decently over time as long as you take care of it. The line level inputs work really nicely. I was concerned sometimes in these types of devices, what they do is they have a line level setting, but it's really just a pad. So you're still running through the preamplifier and you're still you know, going through that whole circuitry and potentially picking up more noise. In this case, it seemed to work pretty nicely and we were able to get some good results when he had a mixer feeding a line level signal into the XLR1. Keeps things very simple because it is powered by the camera. So you don't have a separate set of batteries to worry about. I guess on the downside is that that means that you're not gonna get as long a record time. But again, I think overall it was a good compromise. A couple of things that I wish were not the case, but <laughs> it's important to know. First of all, the preamps get a bit on the noisy side when working with gain-hungry dynamic microphones. So if you're gonna be doing a lot of that type of work, this may not be the perfect solution. But if again, if you're using a condenser microphone, shotgun microphone, something along those lines, you can get very good results with the XLR one. And secondly, the plus 20 dB gain setting is actually a little on the noisy side. I didn't find it really usable. You get a lot of hiss and self-noise from the preamplifier when you put it at that level. So don't really find that usable, but 
almost all the condenser mics I use, and even the dynamic mic, we were able to get enough gain out of it at the zero dB setting. So I think that's just fine. Just something to know. So overall, who is the XLR1 for? I think it's really well suited for corporate video shooters. I think it's also good for people who absolutely hate syncing in post. <laughs> so this can be a solution in that case. It's also very good for, I think, documentary filmmakers where you want to keep the rig very small and unintrusive. And it also can be good for narrative filmmakers if you're trying to feed a line level signal from a proper audio recorder into the camera so it's all synced up. How does it compare to something like a Zoom H6 or a Tascam DR60D Mark II or 70D? I think it's pretty much in the same league. I think subjectively the dynamic range is about in the same range. And I think that the self noise is, uh, I think you could probably do a little better with uh, those others with dynamic mics, but this does just as well, in my opinion, with condenser microphones. The nice thing about this though, that it has over those other two is it's much smaller and it's a pretty good way to keep your rig really small and unintrusive. So overall, there's a look at the XLR1 from Panasonic. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you have not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.